well, borderline personality disorder, that's not a controversial subject at all that gets people obsessed in the comments now, is it? No, it isn't. I would like to describe a hypothesis that I've got. I want to uh, come back to this subject. Um, I was originally going to do a long video, but that would involve lots of editing and work for me. So I'm going to do the parts that I was going to cover in the long video. I'll just do them in, and break them down into shorter videos. I'm going to try and keep this as simple as I can. I suggest that borderline personality disorder be uh, shelved as, as a diagnosis because um, it's probably seriously flawed in its conception. We'll get into that. Maybe not in this video, maybe in a future video. And I think it has got to be one of the most egregiously misused diagnoses that are out there. Allow me to explain. And let me put, let me put my hypothesis to you fairly early on. The simplest way I can say this is I think that what is happening is that there are two broad camps. I have two hands, epistemological dichotomania. Here we come, I have two hands that get the borderline personality disorder diagnosis. I reiterate, I don't think it's a very, I think it's probably out of date and we probably need to get rid of it. I'm not alone in that. It's quite mainstream, mainstream idea in psychology. It's, this probably is an out of date diagnosis. It's probably, it's probably more controversial than it is useful at this point. It carries too much weight with it um, and too much, stigma with it. So the people who get the human beings, mainly women, it's mainly women who get this misdiagnosis, fall into two broad camps, 70% women, based on the data I was just looking at now. There are those who are all of the people, let's, let's pretend there's, a, there's like a, a graph here. I won't bother drawing it. I don't need to. It's too simple. And we have PTSD, we have trauma, and we have a trauma response. Everybody under the umbrella term of BP, BPD is along this axis. Some not so much trauma, some very, very deep trauma, some not so much PTSD, some very deep PTSD. And what does that mean in essence? It means that the individual is on a spectrum along this axis of being emotionally dysregulated. The essence, the key to borderline personality disorder is emotional dysregulation. Therefore, the key, therefore, the sim uh, what's, what, what integrates with that key of emotional dysregulation is PTSD, is, is trauma. We're talking about highly traumatized people. The Problems come when you have two quite, di two at least, but let's keep it simple for this video. Two quite disparate groups of people with PTSD. There's no such thing as PTSD without complex PTSD, in my humble opinion. And there's no such thing as complex PTSD without straightforward PTSD, in my opinion. So there's degrees of trauma and degrees of emotional dysregulation. In this camp over here, you have people who are simply traumatized, simply emotionally dysregulated, who will tick enough of the boxes, they're equally weighted boxes, it's a shopping list of traits, for a clinician to say, you have borderline personality disorder. And these people are just emotionally dysregulated, they have CPTSD, CPTSD is a bummer anyway, so that means they're emotionally dysregulated, they're cycling through uh, uh, very intense emotions, emotional flashbacks. They are struggling with uh, a pretty heavy uh, superego injunction, which is essentially uh, internalized abusive messages like you're worthless or this is, you know, this abuse you're receiving is all that you deserve or you deserve to be ignored or whatever. These are the injunctions that become internalized. So you have a very heavy inner critic, highly emotionally 
dysregulated, heavy inner critic, confused, turbulent emotions, which means interpersonal relationships are turbulent. There will be a tendency towards self-harm because a lot of these intense emotions like fear and rage are driven inwards because the inner critic is so strong. And, you know, they will turn to what are seen by sane and sober people as self-destructive behaviors. But for those of us who've struggled with drugs, alcohol, uh, you know, like the things you associate with BPD are things like drugs, alcohol, sexual promiscuity, self-harm, self-trashing, um, and, and violence, uh, trouble with police even. So at that point, the smart ones amongst you be like, hey, that sounds like psychopathy. Let's cover the, let's cover that psychopathic issue in, in a different video. Cause I think it's fascinating. I think it's really interesting. And it's an example of a general hypothesis I'd like to present here where in, in some ways, like what I would say is in order for psychology to redeem itself, psychology, meaning everything, uh, psychiatry, psychoanalysis, uh, psychoanalysis, uh, counseling, all of it, the whole mental health field, it actually needs to stop its obsession with a forward momentum um, fake progress, which is actually just uh, embracing complexity for complexity's sake at this point. We can jump the shark. We can develop theories that are no longer helpful as we move forward. It's a George Carlin point. Uh, particularly to the PTSD issue, is it better to say PTSD or shell shock? Is it better to say shell shock or battle stress? And he goes through the, the historical development of these terms. And he's making the point that generally speaking, over time, we end up using more words than we need to in an attempt to be balanced, in an attempt to be nuanced, sometimes in an attempt to be politically correct. And in doing so, we lose the essence of what the person is going through. It's already complicated and then we complicate it even more. I'll release a series of videos, I think, over time as I, as I feel like doing it, I'm not making any promises or commitments, I'll do it, along these lines. And this is, this is along these lines. So you've got emotional dysregulation. And then on this side, we've got people who are simply struggling with CPTSD, PTSD, they're emotionally dysregulated and of course, because they're experiencing intense emotions and they have a very, very strong inner critic, they're engaging in what will be perceived by clinicians in the mental health community as self-destructive uh, behaviors. It will look like self-hatred, it will look like self-rage, they will drink, they will take drugs, they will uh, have p turbulent interpersonal relationships, they probably, after all this trauma, will have various permutations of anxious attachment styles, so they won't really be able to relate to people in a way that they feel secure with, so on and so forth. Then on this other side over here, you have a, a it was still under the borderline personality diagnosis, not my diagnosis, not mine, because I don't think it's a particularly useful, I'll give you the terms that I think we should use at the end of the video. It's not my diagnosis. So I said in a video recently, I would probably in my twenties would have been diagnosed as a psychopath and as somebody with borderline personality disorder. And someone in the comments said, but you just said it doesn't exist. And I'm saying, I don't think it's a valid diagnosis. Just because I say a clinician would diagnose me with BPD doesn't mean I submit to the diagnosis. That's just what I would get because you can go and look it up online. It's a fairly straightforward checklist of uh, behaviors and, and manifestations of this intense emotional dysregulation. And I would have ticked them. Same for uh, if you like the factor one, factor two model as a, as a factor two psychopath, I would have probably rung the bells for that as well. I'm not saying I have borderline personality disorder and I'm not saying I'm a psychopath. I'm saying I could have been if I was in front of a clinician during my twenties, where I was living a very, very, very unstable life that was full of drama, full of violence, drugs, and all kinds of nonsense that, that, that is, could have been what I would have been diagnosed as, which then leads us to another controversial topic, which is what is a personality disorder and how much of it is context specific. We'll do that another day with the psychopathy borderline uh, um, overlap subject. In this side, still under the borderline personality di diagnosis, you have people who are very nasty, very, very nasty, very cruel, very mean spirited. Um, they play games with people. 
what they like to do is to bait and switch. So you could have two people in a room who say, oh, my ex-girlfriend was diagnosed with BPD. My ex-girlfriend was diagnosed with BPD. And the guy over here with, with uh, this woman has experienced massive amounts of emotional abuse, gaslighting, bait and switching. He's a shell of his former self. She lies to him all the time. She cheats on him. She steals money from him, so on and so forth. And this guy over here is going, that doesn't sound like my girlfriend. My girlfriend just was a very creative, very wounded person who drank too much, self-harmed, frequently changed their hair color and got loads of piercings and tattoos and um, was, was, was very, very sad a lot of the time. And when I told her I loved her, she wouldn't believe me. And you might look at that and you go, well, that, is that the same... Is that the same personality disorder? It's all under BPD. This one has a very insecure uh, attachment style, extraordinarily low self-esteem, highly creative, a very a labile, changing sense of self, very willing to experiment with different avatars of herself, trying to find her place in the world. She's uncomfortable. She's very creative. He says he loves her and she doesn't... It, the things that he thinks are romantic trigger her into an oppositional response where she goes into abandonment anxiety and when he says he loves her, instead of being happy, she becomes sad or she becomes confrontational. That's different to the dude over here or, the, or you know, it's, it's not a gendered thing. I think there's as many male borderlines as female borderlines. It just doesn't get diagnosed as much because of the many faults in the diagnostic criteria. Men who, who would otherwise be diagnosed as having borderline personality disorder, end up being diagnosed as antisocial personality disorder, what we used to call psychopathy, because of the way they deal with their emotional dysregulation. The emotional dysregulation runs through the middle of this. The emotional dysregulation is key. The trauma is key. The PTSD, the CPTSD is key. How are these two people coping with it? Here's the difference. On this side, very highly active, inner critic and on this side a very highly active inner critic that's in a constant battle with a highly active outer critic why does this type of borderline i do not submit to the diagnosis i'm trying to make a point why does this type of borderline use bait and switch tactics bait and switch could be she or he starts a conversation where let's say they joke about their own trauma. They joke about their own self-harm. They say something, this is actually based on a real conversation from when I was at boarding school, a girl describing herself as a pincushion because she would listen to the cure and then she would either cut or, or she, would, she would hurt herself. And she laughed about it and she said it to me several times. And then one day, I was very young, I was 14, I liked her because she was a goth and she was beautiful and mysterious, I thought. Um, I said it back to her and she went, she went insane, she went crazy. How dare you say that to me? How dare you laugh at my mental illness? I'm on the verge of suicide. But I was like, but, 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 you, but, 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 but you, you said pink question, you said pink question to me and laughed several times making me think this, this was something you found funny and I said it back to you. That's a bait and switch. It's a bait and switch scenario. Why? You, you can break down the tactics of, of borderlines in this area. Um, like to, to multiple permutations, like, um, you know, establishing a relationship with somebody and then suddenly changing the nature of that relationship so they can be offended. It, it comes down to that. I call it bait and switch. Uh, it's kind of a con. It's kind of a con you know, come up this alley and you can, with your $500 and you can buy the brand new iPhone 13, you get bricked over the head, your money's stolen and you get a crappy iPhone 6 or something. It's a bait. The bait is, this is what you're going to get. And as you reach for it, the last second, you get something else. It's passive aggression. It's a way of hurting people, but making them feel like they did something wrong to you. It's a way of hitting people and crying out in pain as you hit them and then getting away with it. Why? 
Why? Because on this side of the fence, the emotional dysregulation and the inner critic is manifesting as intense feelings of humiliation and shame. Intense feelings of humiliation and shame. More than this person's abandonment anxiety. I claim this is some of what I'm saying is mainstream. Some of what I'm saying is my own. I'm claiming on this side of the aisle, there is abandonment anxiety, but the, what is more intense and what is more important in informing the person's strategies and behavior, maladaptive behaviors, self-harming behaviors, is shame, humiliation, and a chronic sense of inferiority. This activates the outer critic. We've spoken loads on this channel and on the CPTSD channel I have about the inner critic. We don't talk much about the outer critic. It's the same machine part. It's the same part of the engine. It's, it's the superego doing its thing maladaptively. A broken superego, a superego broken by PTSD and trauma doing its thing, trying to inflict a warped morality and a warped interpretive matrix of the world on the individual who's carrying it. But this one, this one is a freezing and fawning response type. And this one is a fighting response type. Well, it will go between freezing mortification, humiliation to fighting, it then attacks. Why? Why bait and switch? Why attack? Because it is the only way that this individual has learned to ameliorate the intense feelings of shame and humiliation. So if I say I'm baiting and switching, I need to draw you in. The game is I draw you in. I get you to drop your ego boundaries. I get you to drop your shield, your armor, and then I stab you in the back with a poison blade. When dealing with this type of borderline, you feel slimed. This is a term I got from Chris Godinez. Chris Godinez, who I've done, done interviews with in, uh, where was it, Nevada, I think it was, Tempe. Um, and she's, she's got a good YouTube channel, she calls it sliming. I think she uses it more to talk about narcissists. Uh, strictly speaking, narcissistic personality disorder, but it's but we get the same feeling after interacting with the borderline, this type of borderline, where you feel ripped off because the outer critic is active and they're trying to ameliorate or mitigate their own feelings of their intense feelings of shame, humiliation and inferiority. If I can step on you, if I can step on your head and push you down, I will feel slightly better about myself. And the sick thing is, like, like people who become addicted to cocaine, it works. It works. It actually does make them feel better. So then what happens? Just like a cocaine user, they become addicted. They need to abuse the people around them. They need to trick the people around them. That then becomes an unconscious pattern of behavior that they develop over time. And they're extremely difficult to be around because they can't give up the addiction to beating people in micro social interactions. They can't stop. They need it. They're crackheads. They're jonesing for the little thrill, the little adrenaline rush of putting people down in tiny, tiny ways. And it makes them feel better. They're like the, dry, the drowning person who, you know, you try to help by pulling them out and they would rather pull you in. They don't want to be pulled out, these ones, because that would mean that every, once they're out the water, they lose their victimhood and everybody would see them exposed naked and cold and shivering, and they would see them as a loser. They wouldn't be happy that they'd been saved. They would be furious and ashamed they, that they had fallen into the water into the first place. And their predominant emotion would be shame and not happiness. So when you try and save them, they will drag you in. They don't want to be pulled out of the water. They don't want to be pulled out of their misery. They don't want to be pulled out of their shame. I think, again, when I drift over into real conjecture and real personal opinion, I'm going to say it because most of what I said, like your, your psychotherapist is probably going to be, if they acknowledge borderline personality disorder, they'll probably just go, yeah. If you show them this video, they'll probably go, yeah, most of it, like most of it, this, this not, maybe not. I think in the same way that the narcissist, the NPD, let me not say narcissist, the person with true NPD believes 
that if the false self is destroyed or exposed, that in a certain sense they will die because it's delusional. It's, re it's, re it's related to infantile thinking. It's an infantile delusional defense is the same as if the borderline thinks if they're saved, which is why they get so angry in therapy. It's why they get so angry when people help them. And you would say, but why? They're constantly asking for help. They don't open their mouths without it either being a passive or an active uh, demand for help, a cry for help. All they do, everything they do, the clothes they wear, the food they eat, the music they listen to, everything is a cry for help. Yes, I know. I know, and I know your frustration. Believe me, I know. But they're, they're I wouldn't say they're terrified of help. They're terrified of the potential exposure of being the person who was helped. So you drag them out the water, they're gonna feel very, very, they don't wanna be out the water. They're comfy in there. Notice that, doesn't that resonate with you intuitively? Even as they're telling you, oh, I'm drowning in debt. My love life doesn't make sense. I can't stop the drinking. I can't stop the eating. I can't stop the fucking. I can't stop the but da 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 da. That's where they want to be. That's where they want to be. And when you try and pull them out, they kick off. Okay, so what is this then? And what is this? What are the terms I think we should use? Here's PTSD. Here's trauma. This axis is the EE axis. It's entitlement and exploitation. This type of borderline, again, I don't submit to the diagnosis. I'm just, it's a rhetorical device for, for this. And then I'll tell you at the end of the video what I think we should say. This type of borderline, not entitled, not exploitative. They can be an asshole. They, they can. They could get really angry, you know, but usually it would be drugs or alcohol that, that gets them there and they're really sorry afterwards, which is why when you have videos like this or you debate it on forums, you'll have people in the comments going, my borderline ex-husband wasn't like that. He really was sorry. Like when he, when he had an episode, he really was sorry. He really wasn't. This is, so, and, then, and then that reinforces this idea, well, this is different to narcissistic personality disorder. And I've fallen prey to that. It's a failure of analysis. It's a failure of understanding what's going on here. So on this end of the spectrum, there's no entitlement. They don't feel entitled to, to beat you up. Uh, well, physically, I was gonna say psychologically, but with male borderlines and another type of category that I haven't mentioned yet because I'm saving it, we know that domestic violence is higher. We know the, the, the research is in, but uh, there's another, another word that needs to be used here. Wait, no entitlement, very low for exploitation. Maybe they'll do some bait and switching, maybe, but it's not their predominant manifestation of how they're dealing with these painful uh, superego introjects and the painful emotional flashbacks and the painful emotional dysregulation. Creative types, the creative types, and they, they, they either express it with their music or their books or their whatever they're creating or their artwork, and then they go inward and they're more kind of like introverted types. They need to spend a lot of time on their own. They tend to blame themselves a lot. They even tend to be people pleasers. They look and function as what we would think of as a classic codependent people pleaser, but they, have, they will probably have more piercings and tattoos. They'll probably be, be a higher proponent towards like self-harm and they will change the avatar of who they are quickly and easily because they have they're very, very high in openness. They're very, very high in creativity. And their very um, sense of self is loose. It's loose. Over here, as you get, people can be somewhere on the spectrum. There's all the people somewhere along the spectrum. Here's the middle, it's a neutral point. Exploitation, entitlement. As you get further along here with the exploitation, entitlement, these are people who feel, f who really are in a narcissistic delusion. I always use the word narcissist for borderline. This is where it gets controversial and people get upset. Wait, I'm not done. This is narcissistic delusion. I am special. My victimhood is special. I need borderline supply, which is narcissistic supply, but tinged with pity, tinged with sympathy. And I must at all times be the biggest victim in the room. These are, that's my conjecture. That's my opinion. 
the exploitation is, is baked into the cake. They can't operate with people unless they're stealing from them in some way. They have to be taking from other people without their consent to win, to win, to win. They're losers. They know they are. They're deeply, deeply, deeply mortifyingly ashamed of it. And they're constantly trying to get one little hook up the dominance hierarchy. And if you listen to them and you listen carefully and their guard drops, that's how they talk. They talk in terms of winners and losers. They talk in terms of dog eat dog. And you'll, the smart ones amongst you, the, the psychologically educated amongst you will go, that sounds like psychopaths. That sounds like a psych, because psychopaths have their own morality. They're not immoral. They just have a morality that doesn't probably vibe with you, yours or mine. Criminals have a code. So these border, borderlines, because we're all under the umbrella board, these guys have a code. They have a thing. They have a philosophy. Over here, there's no philosophy. There's no code. They're just coping. They're just coping. They're just barely getting by. Pretty humble, lower entitlement, lower exploitation over here. High entitlement, high in exploitation. And there seems to be a code, some bitter philosophy of life, some sense in which even though they're constantly being destroyed by life, they're, they're, they're like, uh, they're like, um, oh God, one of these gods from like a fantasy novel. Uh, uh, George R. R. Martin and his, uh, I need to call it Lord of the Rings, my God. Game of Thrones, cycle of books. There were gods in there who were like failed gods, broken gods, drowned gods, perpetually martyred gods, perpetually dying and rebirthing gods. They're total losers, they're tramps, they're, they're alcoholics, they're the bottom rung of society, but they're godlike in that status. They're the special, they're the chosen, they're the few. You can't leave them together. They won't band together like grandiose narcissists will because they can't stand it. Grandiose narcissists who are stable can stand it and they will do it for years. They'll build enterprises together. They'll be, uh, Sam Vaknin talks about it, the pro-social narcissist, I don't think is a rarity at all. Uh, I, I, and I think Sam said it and I, and I agree with him, like it's probably more common for a classic grandiose narcissist to be pro-social than anti-social. So these people are not tech, these ones that I'm talking about now, the grandiose narcissist who's pro-social, how could they be psychopathic? How could they be anti-social? I'll do that in another video. So on this one, this is anti-social. They don't mix, they don't hang out together because they have, they could, it's, still, it's still a megalomania, but a megalomania of loserdom. I'm the biggest victim here, me, now. 27 minutes in, I said I'd keep this short. <laughs> There's so much more I want to say about the subject. As I said, I, I was going to do like a video and I thought it'd be an hour. I think it would actually be like a two hour video. So we'll do this in chunks over time. Over here, let's pretend there's no borderline personality disorder. We just get rid of it for the, you know, when you look at the history of it, borderline is like a term that goes back to, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, Charles H. Hughes in 1884, ooh, Nietzsche and Dostoevsky times, J.C. Ross, in 1890, who called the disorder of being a manic depressive, um, highly emotionally dysregulated type, uh, borderline insanity. So you were not insane because you were not delusional, but your emotions were so intense, you were nearly delusional. So you were borderline insane. Uh, friend, uh, sorry, Swiss physician, uh, Theophile Bonnet in 1684 called it Folly, maniaco, melan melancholique, maniac, melancholic, happy, sad, which, you know, manic depressive. It's the roots of manic depression. That means that the term, the roots of the term manic depression goes back to 1684. Pretty impressive. Then you've got the term borderline in 1938 used by Adolf Stern, and then it was developed by Otto Kernberg and Kahoot. We'll do this in a different video. But what they were talking about was trying to figure out like, you've got an individual, really intense emotions, and they're on the borderline. What's the borderline? What's the borderline? The border, so 
when in 1890 and 1884 they said borderline insanity it's not these are not don't worry about how we use the terms today think about how they use the terms historically and stern adolf stern says the borderline between neurosis and psychosis okay what is the difference to, what what's what's the 1880 definition of insanity you've lost connection with this reality you must be delusional to be insane by 1880 standards which would mean it's not my belief it's what they believed it's what they said you must have auditory hallucinations visual hallucinations you must be very confused about where you are who you are and what's going on or or have a completely fantastical narrative of where you are and who you are okay so our old trope of the person in the asylum who believes they're Napoleon Bonaparte or the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's an old trope, it's an old cliche. It, it literally goes back to the 1800s. You, in order to be classed as not sane, meaning clean, in sane, meaning not clean, same etymological root as sanitary, um, you'd have to be delusional. So, and that, in later language, going into the 30s, delusion became psychosis. So if you were tripping out, let me use normal person, like, I'm tripping, man, I can't, like if you literally take an acid or a drug and reality had layers over the top of it of colors and spirals and patterns and sounds, that's insanity in 1880s. It's psychosis in 1930s. So when I say the terms, when Adolf Stern says the term 1938, Adolf Stern says neurosis or psychosis. Neurosis means, what would we use in modern terms? Mental health issues, but no delusion. You're not, you're not living in a fantastical world, but you are. Like you have legitimate mental health issues and you're suffering and you're in pain, but you've not lost your grasp of reality. You've not become insane. Psychosis, in 1938, you were delusional. You, were del you lost your grip on reality. You've, you've now had a psychotic break. You're very confused about what's real and what's not. That's the borderline, folks. That's the borderline. And I don't think that that's the key issue with this personality disorder. I, I really don't. I don't think we should draw a line down. Does this person distinguish between reality or not effectively? I think it's important, my God, of course. Like, if somebody can't tell the difference between reality or not, that's a big issue. But with these two camps, they both know what the difference between reality is and, and, and isn't. It's not, it's not a key issue. Yes, if you're very intensely emotionally dysregulated, at times, your perception of reality will warp but it's not that you're literally having hallucinations. It's that the, the, the um, interpretative system within you that is there to distort, delete, and generalize reality to create cohesive chunks that you can process so that you can form meaning and narrative maps to function in the world is broken, is, is completely broken. Yes, very important. Reality testing is important, but it's not the key thing that distinguishes this personality disorder, to wit, to woo, this over here ain't a personality disorder. And this is curable. This is curable. This is uh, CPTSD. It's CPTSD. If there was a broader understanding and acceptance of CPTSD, we wouldn't have this conversation. Judith Herman, the professor, the Harvard professor, who in 1991, came up with the term complex post-traumatic stress disorder is advocating that we change from borderline personality disorder to emotional dysregulation disorder. That sounds sensible to me. I prefer it was just called CPTSD. Just use Judith Herman's other term, CPTSD. But if she pushes for emotionally dysregulated disorder, I'd back it, I'd back it. CPTSD, emotionally dysregulated disorder. That's these people over here, but on my axis, when they creep along in exploitation and entitlement over here, this is covert, fragile narcissism. This is covert, fragile narcissism. This is where the violence happens. Violence, domestic violence, uh, violence to children and violence to animals. Again, the 
the smart ones are going to say, that sounds like psychopathy. Let's leave that to another day. Grandiose, uh, sorry, grandiose narcissists are, don't do this. They're, they're, there's, no, there's no pattern in the literature that indicates there's a correlation between a grandiose classic narcissist and, and physically hurting children or physically hurting animals. Or physic I'm not saying it never happens. That is not what I'm saying. It's not a standard. It's not a statistical correlation. But it is with people diagnosed with fragile or covert narcissism. Frag I would prefer if everybody started going back to fragile narcissism rather than covert narcissism, by the way. Covert sounds covered. Like the thing that makes it co well, it is, it's co covert, covered. So you would think, well, that just means they're sneaky. It's all sneaky. Everything in the cluster B is sneaky. Fragile, fragile, grandiose, grandiose. I think I'm awesome and I can convince the majority of the world, the majority of the time that I am indeed awesome. Fragile, I think I'm awesome, but the world tends not to agree with me. And sometimes I don't even agree with myself. These people are in a battle between, what did I say before? The outer and inner critic. The outer and inner critic. The defense for them against the inner critic is a narcissistic delusional fantasy of grandeur, but of victimhood. So we don't need borderline personality disorder. We possibly need a subsection of fragile narcissism though, that is obsessed with its own victimhood. We have spent too long, we, like generally in psychology, generally in the mental health field, looking at borderline personality disorder. Not enough time considering fragile narcissism, which massively overlaps with borderline personality disorder, and not enough acceptance of CPTSD and just PTSD. Trauma makes people go a bit mad. But if they're not entitled, they're not exploitative, and the rage and everything else is that, and they're not really engaging in these manipulative, rip you off behaviors it's just emotionally as judith herman says it emotionally dysregulated disorder is fine we'll just say they have cptsd that's it and leave it at that the reason the one reason why you wouldn't do that is because technically speaking the fragile narcissist also has cptsd so that would be a good counter argument they have cptsd with a fight it's a pronounced fight for and response so everything i was describing to you so far that's a fight for and response I fawn to placate you. You're close to me. You're safe. Everything is okay. And then bang, I hit you. I hit you when your guard drops. And just when you thought it was okay, that's when I'm going to get you. This is fragile na narcissism with megalomania. Megalomania is an extremely dated term. I believe we should go back to it. We don't talk about it enough. But it was the terms we use should elucidate. They should clarify. Megalomania is great. That clarifies massively tons of people's behavior and a victimhood obsession, a victimhood obsession. So fragile narcissism with a megalomania to be the number one victim at all times. This is going to reduce the stigmatization that, I mean, it could be as much as, so I said, like 70% of the diagnoses uh, of borderline goes to women. I think based on my, my dumb opinion of like meeting people, talking to people, coaching people. I've met tons of people who said they have BPD, they were diagnosed as BPD. And yes, they're confused. And yes, they can be difficult clients, but they don't attack and they're not arrogant and they don't bait and switch. So what is that? What is that? What I'm saying is these people don't have the narcissistic delusion. They haven't formed this narcissistic defense that says I'm special and therefore I have the right to step on the untermensure, the, 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 uh, what, what would you call it? The unbaptized, the unanointed, sorry, it was the word I was looking for. I have the right to step on the unanointed. I'm special. I'm chosen by God, goddesses, you know, whatever, higher force, the, the, that's so much of this is where all this spiritual psychobabble, uh, spiritual psychobabble comes from. All this crap about being empaths, about being psychic, about being light workers, about being channelers from the Pleiades, people who are parasites, people who are liars and con artists. Not everybody who says they're a Pleiades light worker is a con artist. 
<laughs> those people, and not everybody who says they're an empath is a piece of shit, but those people who are like, I'm an empath, but then they're extremely interpersonally violent, extremely interpersonally bullying, and you're like, so you said you were really empathic. They're actually just fragile narcissists, and they're extraordinarily aggressive, but they look like the innocent flower, but are in fact the serpent under it. It's Shakespeare. Could be Hamlet. Maybe it's Macbeth. No, it's Polonius in, in, in Hamlet. They look like the innocent flower, but they are in fact the serpent under it. Under it, as it's written in Shakespearean language. That's what I wanted to say. Um, I've said stuff about borderlines on this channel. It's upset people. People have written, I've done like reply videos like Richard Grannon stigmatizing people. I'm not. I'm not. I, I'd say we get rid of it. I'm, I would claim that 50% or more, in my dumb opinion, in my anecdotal view of the women that I've spoken to who had, who claimed to have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, didn't, didn't have it. They didn't. They were simply traumatized. They simply had PTSD. They were emotionally dysregulated. When men told me they had borderline personality disorder, Often they were pretty scary dudes who I was like, yeah, you have borderline personality disorder, plus you're probably a psychopath. They just felt dangerous. They just, and I, this is like people I've met in real life and clients that I've spoken to when I used to do coaching work over Skype. Um, when the men said they were diagnosed, I was like, yeah, I think that's probably, <laughs> you are very, very, that's probably right. But what I'm saying overall, what, what, if you decode what I'm saying based on the rest of this video, what I'm actually saying is, yes. So man comes to me and says, oh, I've been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And I would say, yes, that's correct. Clunk, like a, like a, a coin in, a in an old machine from the 70s. It goes down here and it drops over here. Where? So yes, you're a fragile narcissist and probably a psychopath. You're a fragile nut. You're a highly emotionally dysregulated, megalomaniacal, 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 victimhood status obsessed psychopath. You're ashamed of your own grandiosity. You're ashamed of yourself. You cycle between thinking you're the best thing on earth to the worst thing on earth. And that cycling can happen inside of an hour. It can happen inside of a minute. You demand attention, pity and sympathy from everybody. And you like to attack people in subtle, small ways where they're not even sure if they're being attacked or not. And if people spend enough time around you, they start to become a shell of their former selves because it's exhausting to be around people like that. On this side, Therapy will touch it, of course. It's just emotional dysregulation. It's just CPTSD. Uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, great. Pete Walker's concepts, fantastic. Get a good CBT, good transactional analysis practitioner who's got plenty of experience of working with people who are emotionally dysregulated, great. Some of the uh, stuff I've done will absolutely help people who are merely traumatized. Sorry to say it like that, but based on this mess over here, you see why I'm saying merely. Thank God you don't have a personality disorder. This is not a personality disorder. None of this is. Being emotionally dysregulated isn't a personality disorder, which is why I'm not 100% sure with Judith Thurman saying emotional dysregulation disorder, because it sounds like personality disorder. They're just emotionally dysregulated, whatever. That's not. You probably deal with most of that depending on where they are on, on this scale, this axis I've drawn for you of trauma. You probably measure recovery in, in months, um, possibly 24 months, but still, it's still months. It's not like, oh, this is going to take 15 years of your life. Massive recovery. Um, and this corner, they don't want that. They don't want recovery, I claim. That's my claim. The other claim, many people would agree with me, this claim that they don't even want to get better, so it's pointless. They, <laughs> These, the people in this quadrant lie. When they open their mouths, they lie. Everything is a game, everything is a con, everything is a, is a, is a bait and switch. They're counter punches, they're counter punches. And their favorite thing is poisoning the well. 
They don't do big dramatic gestures to get you. They, ooh, they just chip away. And they love to watch your confusion. They love watching you. What? Did, what? what? I thought, what? They love that. They drink it up. They drink it up. They drink your milkshake, Eli. There will be blood. What? There's no excuse for people following this channel to have not watched the film. There will be blood by now. You want to see the narcissistic psychopath, the birth of the red blooded scalp hunting American oil baron corporate psychopath. You've got to watch that movie. The battle between church and state and corporations is just fantastic. If I have a straw and you have a straw, you see it. There it is, Eli. Enough. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that that was useful. I hope it clarified uh, my position. I really wanted this to be simple. And my intention was that like with this video, I'll just do a simple one to start, but it's hard to talk about this subject without it getting uh, a little bit complicated. We'll, we'll cover it again in other videos. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. And um, I look forward to speaking to you soon. Cheers.